Hi everyone. Um, hope getting to know your team went well. Sorry for some of the initial confusion with the team matching, but hopefully everyone's matched now and ready for the next session. Um, so now we're really excited to move on to Ed Talks, where educator participants volunteer to give an eight-minute talk on something they're passionate about and how it relates to education. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's start with Ms. Robin Glassberg. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. I have been a part of Ignite STEM since their inception, and I'm honored and humbled that they invited me to present, and I love their mission. I am a professor at St. John's University, where I train teachers in clinical supervision and teaching. Uh, Today, what we're gonna talk about is the kaboom of technology in the traditional classroom and how to use apps to differentiate. We're gonna look at the apps that work for interactive lessons, a description of apps, and then in 2019, looking at some data from 2019 to 2020, which there's a minimal amount of data. And then the difficulties teachers face in remote teaching and a hybrid model to your roadmap for, I'm sorry, a hybrid classroom, a roadmap for the fall. So why am I calling this the kaboom of technology in the classroom? I started teaching in 2003. And when I started teaching, I used technology in K to 12. In 2007, I had a classroom where I taught social studies and the class was all in a computer lab. In the computer lab, I was able to have access. Mind you, I'm dating myself. This was before Google Classroom. So with the, all that said, I was actually also doing teaching in graduate school where it was hybrid and online interaction prior to pandemic. It takes a lot to learn about technology and want to use it in the classroom. And research shows that you need professional development to do it. So let's dive in to some apps that are really great and helpful. My favorite is Padlet. Padlet is great because you can use it so easy, easily and it's interchangeable. You can also use it in as a, a, a post-it board and it's real time. I've seen it used in businesses and different classrooms many, many times. I use it very frequently. Another one that's great is called Whiteboard Phi. And Whiteboard Phi is in immediate use again and you can access the whiteboard immediately. You can use math symbols. There's a library, tons of teaching tools. And it's temporary, but you can start a subscription. So it's free to start. Kami is another, another uh, sorry, app that I think is wonderful. And I'm going to show you a quick clip of that app in action. And what this one does is it allows for video, conversation, speech recording, and even allows you to use video. If you are in a remote classroom right now or a hybrid situation, due to COVID-19, you are able to get a free 90-day trial. Uh, and then Pear Deck. Pear Deck is great for tablets and it's great for modeling and it's very very interactive so this is also another add-on that you can add on to your microsoft google classroom all of them are add-ons as you could see from the chart so these are great ways to differentiate and bring interactivity into your classroom for difficult subjects and literacy so let's take a moment, one minute, to view a quick clip about Cami.
Now, the reason why I felt that was so important for you to see is because Cami really has made online teaching very easy for many of my teachers and for myself. And there's a little anecdote about how a teacher on the side over here has used Cami to be able to speak to her students and use her voice. And it's great for SPED students and L's. So put a chat in the, put a one in the chat if you have used any of these apps or, well, if they're new to you. So moving on quickly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about moving from sometimes technology to all the time. So in 2019, classrooms were traditional and didn't have to rely on technology. In a study by Cambridge International, the US was one of the highest countries to next to China that uses technology in the class. 70% des desktop, 74% usage of smartphones and 59% smart boards. 2020, there wasn't a lot of data, but what we do know is that classrooms across the country had to use technology. Those that didn't were minimal and they were struggling. Many classrooms will be a hybrid model in the fall. So why is it so difficult to switch to an all remote hybrid learning K to 12 classroom if we have all this technology and we're close to being the one of the top five countries in the world who uses technology in the classroom? The difficulties teachers face, multitasking, grade, grades, lessons, differentiating, highly engaging, building community, collaboration. And as a, our speaker earlier, our keynote speaker earlier presented change. That's a big issue too. Just being able to change and not being professionally developed. And what are some solutions? Become an expert with platforms and apps for modeling and interaction. Make slides fun and student friendly, large text, emojis, pictures, colors, and build online icebreakers, community icebreakers, a scavenger hunt on the technology. So quickly, let's just talk about the hybrid classroom, a roadmap, which is definitely going to be the model for the fall. So in spring, what can you do now? Assess your computer, look at your subscriptions, check with your school. Do they have a subscription? Don't they? Then in the summer, try to start planning to get comfortable with several of your apps and sign into them, play with them on your phone, get more excited about it and the content that you're teaching. And in the fall, have your slide decks made with lesson materials organized with your app add-ons from either the apps I mentioned or apps you know. And this will allow you to see the connections between the activities for potentially all students being online or on site. So here are some other resources that uh, will be hopefully sent to you. And there are other class, uh, I guess, websites that can help you out and citations where I've gotten some of my material from as far as the data. So thank you. And again, my name is Robin Glassberg, and I want to open it up to any questions if we have time. Um, so we actually only have time for one question, um, but thank you so much for sharing. So I guess really quickly, um, someone asked, Padlet sounds very interesting. Could you explain more about it, um, like what it does? Yeah. So Padlet, as an add-on, what you can do is you, if you have Google Classroom or Microsoft, when you download it and you download the add-on, wait, oh, you said Padlet. I'm sorry. So she said Pear Deck. Padlet. <laughs> it's, uh, if you go to the website for Padlet, you just sign up and literally the board opens up and there are post-it notes where you could, you start, you could put in questions and it works live, live with your students. You send them the code and then, or you send them the link and they click on it and it's live. And so they can see students writing while you're writing, while somebody else is writing, you can add video, you can add voice. So 
it's I urge you to try it. It's really exciting. And when you see it, uh, you're like, wow, I've seen students add videos to their post-it board. It's basically like a huge virtual post-it board that is interactive. Awesome. Okay. And then I guess, sorry, I noticed that that was the last question, but this is actually the last question. Um, so how can we empower the students to approach apps like creators, not just like consumers? Yeah, I, I, I think that it's really important to help your students get familiar with the apps. So if you want them, to, if they want to be able to interact, it, interact with it, they have to be familiar with it. And then you have to, as the teacher, you have to help to empower them to be comfortable with it. And that way they will then, once they, once you show them how to use it, like for example, a scavenger hunt icebreaker, showing them how to move around the computer, showing them how to do these, um, these, these apps. That is how you can help them become a creator rather than just like, okay, I'm here. Um, you, you, you need to teach them how to use it because just like you and I, they're not really sure. They may not be using, even though they use their phone, they might not be aware of how to use this technology. Did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, I think that was really great. Um, that sounds good. There's a couple more questions in the Q&A section, but I think that just for the sake of time, we can move on to the next speakers. But um, Robin, I know you're going to be around for the rest of the day. So if anyone has any questions, um, yeah, thank you so much for speaking. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Do I leave? Oh, yeah, if you want to leave. Um, okay, sorry. He's going to come on now. <laughs> um, okay, great. So um, our next speaker is going to be Mrs. Regina Nadby Ali, who is joining now, I think. Or Rohit, do you want to announce? I believe Regina will be joining us shortly. I'm just here to help with the presentation. Okay, sorry, I had a little trouble with my um, internet there. I am back. Uh, thank you, Rohit, and thank you to the uh, Ignite STEM team for allowing me to present today. This is my third actual Ignite STEM. And good morning, my name is Regina Nadbiomi. And I am the gifted and talented STEM teacher in Orange, New Jersey for first to fifth grade, now in my seventh year of teaching. Next. Two years ago, I won a grant from Ignite STEM to purchase 10 Tello drones. And I decided to combine coding drones with National Geographic resources in my fifth grade class. We explored how drones help to save endangered and threatened animals from poachers and in search and rescue missions. Each year I write my own curriculum and I go back and forth between hands-on design engineering activities and coding on a variety of platforms. I also in incorporate interdisciplinary and cross-curricular -cur connections that connect real world applications and empathy to some of our projects. I look for opportunities to learn from other educators through various STEM and technology conferences like this one, as well as online professional development. Next. Last year is part of the National Geographic Educator Certification Program. I learned about some of the resources that National Geographic offers, as well as teaching students to look at problems on local, regional, and global scales. Students worked in small groups to research 21 threatened and endangered animals and then created either a poster or a persuasive essay about the animal. When it was time to code the drones, students learned how to connect the drones to the DroneBlox app, how to safely take off, fly in a square, complete a challenge, and land using block-based coding. In preparation for coding in drone blocks, students have learned block-based coding using code.org, Scratch, Microsoft MakeCode, and more. Since I see the same students from year to year, we are able to build upon their knowledge from previous years. Next. Fifth graders were fortunate enough to code the drones last March for one day, but unfortunately the next week we went remote because of the pandemic. 
I was not able to continue with the drones challenges as we were suddenly teaching online. At that point, I switched my lessons to remote learning while I spent many hours trying to reinvent my lessons and took many workshops as companies were allowing educators to use their paid subscriptions for free. One of those that I used was Breakout EDU, where students competed, completed coding puzzles to break out of each room. They really enjoyed that. Next. This year, since we have continued to teach remotely, I've been teaching coding to first and second graders using code.org and third to fifth graders using a Dash robot simulator in Dash's neighborhood, which is a paid subscription. Next. I currently have my fifth graders competing with schools across the country in Mission to Moon hands-on design engineering challenges. In January, I won a grant from Vivify STEM to participate in this competition, which includes professional development, curriculum, and four teams to participate. Students are learning from NASA engineers and are combining science and engineering as they complete challenges each week. In one of the weekly competitions, our team won a telescope for each of the six members of the team. Next. Students designed their own mission patch, built their own roller coaster, astronaut helmet, greenhouse with the plant that they grew from a seed in a plastic bag, a tower that powers a welcome sign with an LED light and battery, a robotic arm, and a rover that moves. They are currently designing and building a lunar base. Since working remotely, we miss collaborating on these hands-on projects. This curriculum was developed for in-person learning and collaboration, but it has been modified for remote learning. Next. However, students have been able to collaborate with each other in our breakout rooms while coding. Students share their screen and work together to complete coding challenges. In addition to coding each week, I have shown short videos about robots and brought in a guest speaker to talk about how he became interested in computer science in the fifth grade because of a robotics class. In a few weeks, I have a civil engineer and author speaking with our fifth graders. Next. Soon our third to fifth graders will go in go on a virtual field trip to an Amazon fulfillment center through Amazon Future Engineers. We will see how computer science, state-of-the-art engineering, and incredible people deliver customer orders at Amazon. Although I'm looking forward to returning to the classroom, I anticipate that there are some good things that were made possible through technology in a virtual environment that are here to stay, like virtual field trips. Next. When we are in person, I use a variety of physical computing devices and robotic, robots to enhance our lessons. Students have learned about circuitry using a Makey Makey. They have coded a micro bit after creating a pet for a classmate. They use scratch coding to tell the story of a person of interest during Black History and Women's History Months. However, watching 10-year-olds fly drones was a highlight in the STEM lab last year. Next. We have a couple of video clips of the drones. So yours is going to go in a square. Square. Ah, okay, the square. 
And who is this flying now? All right, nice. When you're done, did you get to go to the animal event? Yes. Flip. Next. There are so many opportunities and there are lots of resources out there for our eager young learners. I've only presented a small sample of what we have done in the STEM lab, both in person and remotely. Thank you. I don't know if there's time, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. And thank you for presenting, Rohit. Hi, thank you so much for sharing. That was really great. Um, so we actually do have a good amount of questions, um, so I can just start reading them out to you. Um, so the first one is, how did you find the virtual field trips? Uh, in the spring last year, we went virtual. Some of our tech coordinators were sending lists of field, virtual field trips. Um, the Amazon, I recently, the future engineers, I had signed up last summer to be on their email list. So I got an email about that. So anybody actually can go ahead and um, look up Amazon Future Engineers and sign up for that uh, virtual field trip. Awesome, okay, cool. Um, so I guess the next question is, this is kind of a pivot, but as someone who has never worked with drones, how would you recommend teachers go about incorporating drones into their classroom learning? I would definitely recommend starting with um, block, another type of block-based coding like code.org or Scratch uh, as a base first. So my students had that base in the fifth grade. Um, I, it, you could do so many different things with the drones. I just happen to want to try to connect those to the National Geographic resources. But if I didn't, we would have just done challenges like uh, flying in a square, flying in a in an octagon, a hexagon, I was starting off with different um, shapes to have them code those. And then we were gonna try different challenges with like flying through hula hoops and, you know, we would have gone down to the, um, to the lunchroom for more room to, to try those types of challenges. I'm still learning more about the drones because as I mentioned, uh, the next week we went remote. So we have not flown the drones or used them since, but I'm hoping that in the future when we're back in person, we can code them again. Awesome. Okay. And then I guess this is kind of similar, but what's an example of one activity you think all teachers should do with their students, with drones or without drones, either way? I am big into coding. My background is computer science, and I don't think that there's enough uh, coding and, and computer science in the elementary levels. And I think it's very important to start in the elementary levels because by middle school and high school, if they have not been exposed to it. Um, they're not likely to go into it. Uh, I love code.org. The curriculum is there. Uh, you don't have to have a computer science background to teach that. I also love Scratch. The kids love Scratch. So in third grade, I introduced Scratch. You have to code.org in first and second. Uh, they're allowed to be more artistic and creative with Scratch. And I love Google CS first for uh, Scratch. They have eight lessons and I've done different ones. There was storytelling we did two years ago. Last year we did music. And I think that's also the Google CS First is great for um, helping with that. The micro bit I mentioned, those are only about $10 each. And you could use block-based coding with Make Code, Microsoft Make Code, which is free. They have tutorials on that. I highly recommend, recommend that as well. Cool, okay. And then I guess it's kind of similar in terms of tool that you've been using, but you mentioned how for drones you can be able to do it since like the pandemic. Um, find any other online collaboration tool? Can you talk more about how you've been collaborating with the students in the virtual setting? We've just, our, uh, we've been on Google Meet, so that's how we've been collaborating with each other. Unfortunately, because we're remote, all of the Mission to Moon um, activities that would normally be as a team students are building those individually at home and then we're sharing using Flipgrid videos. So that's how we're collaborating as well. Awesome. Okay, and then I guess just one final question from Joan. 
Um, do you have any methodology on teaching and guiding on the ethical standard in utilizing drones um, for your students, or do you kind of skip over that because they're younger? The very first day, I spent probably 20 minutes just going over the safety of it, um, just so that, you know, we made sure that there were no incidents. Uh, that was a big part of the very first lesson. Awesome. Okay, so I think this is all the time we have for questions for you today, but um, are you going to be sticking around for the rest of the event? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so hopefully you can be around to answer questions um, on a more personal level. Um, and thank you again so much for speaking. Your talk was really interesting. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, cool. So I guess now we can move on to our final speaker, um, Dr. Clint Harris, if you want to come on here. Hi. So if you want to share your screen, you can start whenever. Oh yeah, also while we're talking, um, while we're waiting for the share screen, I uh, wish to remind you all about some of the features for Hopin and about our next events. So following Clint's talk, um, we're going to go into Lunch and Learn, where you'll have the option of either networking or um, a, a workshop session where you can eat during it. Um, so we're really excited for that. And then after that, we're going to have more design thinking modules, just to give you guys a preview of what's happening after this. I think we're having some technical difficulties, but Dr. Clint will be back shortly. Um, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions about the event or anything, um, feel free to message in the chat of the stage so we can answer them while we're waiting. I also just wanted to take a few seconds to let everyone know about the agenda that's coming up next. Uh, at 11.45, we have two things happening in parallel. So we have a lunch and learn, which is a networking session where all teachers can network with each other. But the main point is to have lunch, basically. Uh, Ignite some members will be around the help desk. Uh, the second thing to note is that I'm not sure if Nastasia had a chance to announce the CSD workshop. Uh, but uh, we have a workshop that's coming up at 12 PM. Uh, led by Brandon Bryan, who is the head of CSD. Uh, and Clint should be hopping on in a minute. I will I will hop off the backstage now. Uh, sorry again for the delay. We're just going to wait a couple more seconds. Um, and if not, we have another talk planned. Oh, and to answer some questions from the chat, um, for anyone who has not been assigned to a group yet because you were late or something happened, um, yeah, so after this, during the lunch or afterwards, um, feel free to come to the help desk. 
and we'll definitely reassign you to a new group very easily. Um, it's no problem. And then for the second question, we will be posting the name to the speakers for the session after this, as well as all of their slides. So hello everyone. Um, I'm not an educator, sadly. I'm not even finished being educated and we're hoping to get Dr. Harris back at any moment. Obviously, whatever he has to say is going to be far more interesting than what I have to say. So if you can make it back, Dr. Harris, please feel free to interrupt. Um, I do think that I'd be really excited to talk a little bit about an experience that I've had over the past four or five years, which is an experience to see competitive robotics at all levels of uh, the of all levels of the pyramid. I've been done it as a participant. I've done it as a coach, as a mentor, a competition organizer, a national organizer, and I'm just really excited about this really new, evolving type of after-school activity that has grown so much in the past few years. And I really think that especially with the type of teachers we've seen here today, um, it's going to be a truly fantastic um, opportunity to, um, to, uh, learn, to really engage um, students in a different type of after-school activity. So I just want to talk um, about two themes today. One is like the influence that robotics competitions had on me as a participant of 10 years and the pitfalls you might encounter trying to start a robotics program at your own school. So a little bit about me. Um, I have been doing robotics since I was in third grade. Uh, I've done it in a variety of different settings in practically all different youth level competitions. And I've done it in several states and more recently in several countries. Um, and I think that uh, the really exciting part about it is like, as I remember before robotics, I was just like a really intensely shy kid. And how did that change to being able to speak through a virtual room of almost 100 people here today? I credit that almost entirely to robotics. Um, it doesn't do as a fourth or a fifth. All right, we now have Dr. Harris back, I believe. Yeah, it's not doing anything. Okay. All right. Um, all right. We can uh, reach another assignment. For now, we can just let it go. Okay. Are you? Uh, are you? Uh, are you? Right, now I have you back. I believe at the moment we're hearing Dr. Harris on a different uh, avenue. Um, let's. I'm going to continue with my presentation for now. Hopefully, we get him back. Um, I think so. I really like robotics is a um, technical activity, but I credit it with teaching me how to speak, how to present. It's really the only avenue that I had as a fourth grader or a fifth grader to um, uh, be put in a situation where uh, I was uh, relatively, um, where I was asked to defend my ideas to judges. So I can talk a little bit about also um, the there are a number of reasons that uh, people might be skeptical of robotics, and I hope to address some of them. So, like, there's a classroom model versus a competi competition oh, model. Sorry. We can't see your screen share right now. Um, do you want to stop sharing and try again? <laughs> I appreciate that people are appreciating my backup presentation. Uh, I, I do think that... Um, it's a really exciting, uh, a really exciting theme. So I do want to address some of the reasons that people might be a little bit skeptical. Um, so I've both taught robotics in a classroom setting and in a competition setting. And this all started about three years ago when in my 10th grade year of high school, I moved across the world to Singapore where American robotics wasn't as big of a thing. And at my school, they did have a robotics class and we struggled with enrollment for a number of years. 
I helped my school move to the competitive model and it really did change things. Number one, intuitively, we think, right, that first you need to get all the fundamentals in the classroom and then kids can really explore in the after school setting. I found that really when we start exploring in the after school, in the competitive setting, the kids are teaching and learning themselves. And that really uh, empowers them to further uh, develop the fundamentals on their own. And so we did some mentoring at a local school, uh, which didn't have a robotics competition at all. And it was tough going for the first few weeks. We took the um, students to a robotics competition with all the energy that that had. And the next weeks when we came back, the kids had ideas of their own. They were just following the teacher. This was a very important part of how we got this done. Um, and so there's also like the robotics competition often competes with the science fair model, both of them or the makerspace model. Both of these things have a lot of valuable uh, roles in the classroom. In general, I think robotics is best suited to teach engineering skills, while science fair, generally the guidelines focus more on biology and chemistry skills. There's a role for both of them. Robotics can take the role of a sport in a kid's life, especially those who aren't as inclined towards um, uh, athletics. So I think those are some of the reasons that it's, um, that it's a viable activity. And many people also aren't aware about how well the robotics competitions are structured to match these concerns. So both first Lego League and Vex IQ, which are two of the largest elementary school robotics competitions, have research components. And FLL specifically requires deep interdisciplinary research. Every year, the kids are assigned a theme from natural disasters to senior solutions to transportation. Uh, these, And then the kids have to research around a the theme and construct innovative solutions. And I haven't done first Lego League since I was in middle or elementary school. And those are still some of my greatest accomplishments in terms of coming up with the creativity and innovative solutions that we're doing still here today um, in this conference. It's really a life skill. So what are some of the what are some of the keys to creating a program from scratch, which I had to do in Singapore? I think the thing that stops a lot of teachers is we feel that robotics is an intensely complicated activity that we don't know enough about to teach. And the truth is that no one who's teaching robotics at the K through 12 level could possibly know enough to teach it. Really, kids are doing PhD level works in high school and middle school classrooms. It's um, it's pretty incredible how uh, we've empowered people to um, to to do this level of work. And that's not because the teachers, including me, know any of this, but the core of engineering as it has been for, has been taught since really the 1940s in engineering classrooms is you focus on the fundamentals. The role of the teacher is to put discipline into the classroom, forcing them to write an engineering notebook every day, forcing them to think about different design styles rather than just going to what works immediately, forcing them to keep documentation. And those good engineering fundamentals lead themselves to good engineering design. Now, anyone who's assigned kids to write knows how difficult that can be. I have no easier time with it when I was mentoring middle or elementary schoolers than, um, than anyone else. But once we put them in the competitive setting and their writing is being uh, uh, assessed against teams around the world and they have a chance at advancement, one of my teams last year for their engineering notebook over the course of the season wrote 400 pages. Now, I can't write 400 pages if you told me to, and I've been doing this for a long time. It's the competitive pressure that inspires kids to do their best. I gave them some initial tools, and obviously I had done robotics before. Uh, I gave them some initial tools, but the designs that my programs are designing today, I definitely couldn't do on my own without a lot of years of uh, college, which I have not completed yet. So those are just some of the ways that self-learning empowers them. So I'm here, I encourage you, if you're thinking about this, do talk to me. Um, I have my own curriculum for robotics um, because I don't feel that the kits uh, generally generally um, lead teachers in a positive direction. They can be relatively discouraging in the long term. I think the core role of a teacher is to focus on fundamental and developing a culture. There are a ton of resources out there if you know how to find them. Practically every robotics competition there is emphasizes outreach and helping other teams start from scratch. If you know where to find these things and we can direct you to them, these are 
easy ways to uh, introduce a robotics program in your into your school with a lot of support. And there's also a lot of grants available specifically for this purpose. Uh, the two major robotic competitions have spent 20 years really developing corporate relationships to make sure these grants are available. So please, please do talk to me. I'm really sorry we didn't get to hear Dr. Harris today, but um, I, I do think that this is a fantastic opportunity that's just going to grow in future years. So uh, we are now going to break for lunch, I believe. So uh, I believe some other team member will give some brief instructions. Hi everyone, from here we are going to move for lunch. Uh, along with lunch, we have a lunch and learn networking session, which you can find under the networking tab to the left of your screen, where you can just speak with your fellow teachers and get to know them. Alternatively, we are also having a workshop, uh, which will be under the sessions tab. To join that, um, you can proceed there. It will be led by Brendan Prime, who is the studio manager um, of the studio lab at the Princeton's Council on Science and Technology. The workshop will be on how to effectively use project or educational kits for STEAM learning in the classroom. So please, please head over for lunch and you can join either the networking session or sessions for the workshop.